In the past few weeks, if not more, we've been hearing about the tragedy that is unfolding concerning the Rohingya Muslims. Isn't it amazing that some of us haven't got a clue who is and what are Rohingya Muslims? Why are they floating in the sea? As someone has described, it's almost like a graveyard. Who's responsible? Why are they not in their own country? Do they have a country? And I want to quote you someone who explains that sometimes it is easier to forget than to highlight difficult or ask difficult question. Guy Horton, Guy Horton, I beg your pardon, is a journalist, a blogger, who has written extensively on the issue. And he says that the best way to deal with embarrassing, inconvenient facts is to ignore them. Is that what is happening? Is that what we are doing? 20% 20, 20 of Burma's population has gone missing. Eight million people have not been accounted for. That's more than the Holocaust. So what is happening? What can we do? I'm today delighted, of course, to have two guests with me. Adnan, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. And Majid, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Welcome, boys. Thank you very much. Isn't it a tragedy that's unfolding? Adnan, just t maybe you can just uh, uh, highlight some of the background information. What is going on? Who are these people? <coughs> it's, it's, the, it's the background information that's actually gone missing in this in entire episode, in this entire story. Nobody's been speaking about it for the last few weeks, as y you said. It's actually the last few days that this small you know, little episode in this massive uh, travesty that's been occurring for you know a couple of years now has unfolded and it's caught the world's attention because it's it's a very absurd and adverse turn of events where you have a small group of people uh, stranded um, you know mid ocean in between five or six nations Indonesia Malaysia. Thailand, Philippines, you know, all of these nations surrounding that area. Um, trying to run away from the actual reality of what was going on and was being ignored by the world. Um, so it's almost like, you know, trying to treat a, a headache and ignoring the actual causes and the disease and the illness that is there at the root. The Rohingya Muslims <coughs> are one of the one of the very few groups of people, you know, ethnic groups of people across the uh, world who are stateless because of a purely racist, uh, xenophobic um, agenda, a prejudicial agenda from a state apparatus that's never accepted them as people who are citizens of Burma, uh, people who belong within the state and society uh, for a variety of different political uh, reasons, uh, some of which we, we see played out to, you know, much smaller or much more subtle varieties all across the world. You know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, trying to pit the, the people against one another for political gain. It happens everywhere across the world. This is a particularly extreme example of it. Um, a few, like I said, a few of those people have tried to escape that tragedy, that reality, and set sail without having a destination. Risking their lives mm -hmm. at sea has been a preferable option for them than the daily murder, loot, rape and everything else that has been happening whilst the world has ignored the reality on the ground in Burma. But complaining about the behaviour of, you know, the hypocrites who, you know, speak up uh, for selectively speak up for you know people's rights here and there, nations such as uh, Australia who who go out of their way, for example, to say right we're boy boycotting um, Indonesia mm -hmm. because they they tried and uh, executed you know placed death penalty upon a handful of people for drug traffic trafficking charges because this goes against our values. They'll turn a complete blind eye to the fact that 
you know, a, a, a group of 800,000 people of one ethnicity have suffered repeated torture, ostracization, abuse for decade upon decade, but it's intensified where it's, it's taken on a murderous reality. Nobody cares because it doesn't fit in with any sort of mm. geostrategic interest in the area. But what is more tragic than all of these nations, or the point that I was going to come to, is the, the shameful, the embarrassing behaviour of so-called Muslim nations, Bangladesh next door, who refuse to take them in. Bangladesh has a population in excess of 180 million. If you cannot accommodate 800,000 people, who are Muslims, who fear for their life, literally, on a daily basis. If you cannot do that, the existence of your, your you know, proud nation it, it, in itself is in question. I don't uh, agree with or believe in or you know, propagate the idea of nationhood and these artificial boundaries anyway, anyway. But for those who do, this is the biggest argument against for Muslims. Biggest argument against the, the very... Uh, sickening and disgusting man-made notion of drawing lines on a map to divide peoples because somehow those who happen to have fallen inside this, uh, this imaginary boundary mm -hmm. of a nation called Bangladesh are uh, rightful um, you know, owners or rightful, uh, rightfully belong within that nation. They have all the the, the, the rights which are severely curtailed in Bangladesh, but that's a separate topic. But they have all the rights, all the protection of the state, etc., etc. But it doesn't really matter if you connect with people who are Muslim and the idea of Ummah that Muslims have always had for the past 1400 years. That's out of the window. So long as you don't belong inside these borders, you it doesn't matter you. what is happening to you in your own reality. You know, it's it's, it's being ethnic ignored, cleansing, basically. Being ignored. It's ethnic cleansing. Uh, Majid, I wanted to ask you, but I just want to quickly say that the, uh, I read today that the West African nation of Gambia has offered to take all the Rohingya Rohingyan refugees as part of the sacred duty. Isn't that embarrassing? For, as you quite rightly said, that you have countries like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Kuwait. These are, you know, relatively... It's always the poor helping the poor. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the irony of this is, is that <clears throat> um, in the last few years, We've seen uh, armies being used for objectives which serve these particular kingdoms and these dictatorships in the Middle East. Those nations that we expect for them to do something do not make any response. So whether it was Gaza in the past, uh, other tragedies of, of that have befallen the Muslim world, they haven't even battled an eyelid. But as soon as there was some protests in Bahrain, you found the, the kingdom yes. deciding to use his army for the sake of you know, uh, um, you know, stopping some sort of influx or influence of you know, regime change inside their own country. Recently we've said it as well, with Yemen, they've decided, in fact, even they've even called, gone, far and gone to Pakistan and said, you know, we want you to sign up to this particular agenda where we want to use your troops to defend Saudi soil. So it can happen. This is the thing. This is, this is the, I think we need to really open our eyes to this. If the Muslim world ha wa wants to inject the political will to do something, it has the capacity and it has the ability to do this. Now, the issue that we're facing over here with the Burmese government and the way it treats the Rohingya Muslims, I mean, this can be resolved diplomatically very, very easily. Very, very easily by simply uh, sending the strong, you know, first of all, the diplomatic signals. If not, then you can start getting out your navies out in those particular waters mm -hmm. and really sending a strong message back saying, look, you know, here we are, we are going to protect these Muslims, we will take them on board. It's not acceptable. But this type of... Uh, um, mm -hmm behavior of how you treat your, what should be your own citizens and leave them to, you know, to their death in the, in, the, in the waters, this is completely unacceptable. But how is it possible that, <clears throat> I t totally agree with you Adnan, that uh, forget the rest of the world, forget the uh, United States, forget the United Kingdom, forget the Western world, we haven't done anything, the Muslim nations haven't done Pakistan, anything. But Pakistan hasn't done anything. Pakistan's uh, SSG commandos mm. were ranked the best division of a, a force anywhere in the world very recently. The ISI is repeatedly ranked as number one or in the top three intelligence agencies in the world. Pakistan's army is ranked in the uh, top ten of the world repeatedly. What for? So that you can be a renting army for America when it kills Muslims? Burma! Burma should not at least have the guts. They shouldn't dare to lift a finger on, uh, on a Muslim because they fear that 
actually, you know what? We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to sustain an attack for 24 hours. Yes. What is your army for? What is that pathetic army for which all Pakistanis seem to be proud of for no reason? What is it for? What has it achieved? What, India attacked us two or three times so you had to defend yourself? Well, you dragged into that war. Fair enough. You know, they, they, they did well in certain uh, situations. But since 1971, which is the last time that they actually ended up committing murder and mass atrocities against their own people in what was then East Pakistan, what has this Pakistan army actually done except for be sent out all across the globe as part of United Nations peacekeeping forces because they pay you money? Pakistan provides the largest delegation of its soldiers for African peacekeeping. Why not America? Why not India? Why not China? They have far bigger armies. Why are your soldiers only available, or like Majid said, Saudi Arabia, asking for Pakistanis to provide support in killing other Muslims in Yemen? So Why are Pakistan army only to be used for killing Muslims or as, as mercenaries? Why is it that they, there's no principle, no political will, nothing? to actually do something on, about something that is on your doorstep. Is somebody making money out of this? Out of? Well, I mean, d d funds are there, isn't it? Pakistan receives funds, doesn't it? it, it's, it you, can, you can speak of, if you want to speak about the monetary terms, then you can say that these people actually value the economic, uh, economics of things more than they do principle or anything else. Because when they, when they start testing missiles, for example, or this, this missile can carry a nuclear warhead and it can reach Tel Aviv. It can reach Israel, that's what they'll say. Well, Burma is far closer. Let's have some reach there. Not advocating that there's violence, but there are situations in which everybody across the globe will agree that violence is a necessity to stop violence. Yeah, but you've got if, if, a, if, a, if a stateless, helpless, weaponless people are repeatedly attacked by the so-called peaceful Buddhists, then give me, give me a different scenario in which you would justify the use of an army. Mm. It's not a war of aggression. We're not asking you to go and occupy Burma. But mm. Majid already referred to, you can use diplomatic means, etc. Et you should have the backbone to be able to actually just say, okay, you know what, your life is unsustainable there. We'll take Muslims in. As the Ottoman Empire did when it couldn't, it couldn't physically help the Muslims when their empire came to an end in 1492 in Spain. But hundreds and of thousands of Muslims, Jews, ran away from there and were given sanctuary. That's the least they could do. They realized... Well, Gambia's done it. Yeah. I mean, Gambia has done it. Gambia has offered... Gambia's offered. We'll re relocate the entire people. But how, how shameful a people do you have to be that a nation of 1.5 billion people... And that's what you have to understand you are, whether you like it or not. A nation of over 1.5 billion people needs... A poor African country, and you know, this is not taking anything away from Gambia, all credit to them for their statement. Mm. But it needs a poor African country to stand up and protect 800,000 of you. The rest of 1.5 billion of you do not have enough shame or dignity between you to do something about it. This is, this is the problem with Muslims not even looking at things correctly when it comes to problems. But I just wonder, I'll be very honest with you, you and I were having a conversation last night. हम लोग बात कर रहे थे और तुमने एक बहुत अच्छी बात की सॉरी आपने एक बहुत अच्छी बात की थी कि कनेक्शन टूट चुका है देयर इज अ कनेक्शन बिटवीन पीपल बिटवीन द उम्मा बिटवीन द मुस्लिम्स दैट इज गॉन सो मेनी पीपल डू नॉट नो व्हाट इज रोहिंग्या व्हाट इज द सिचुएशन व्हाई डोंट वी नो दिस क्योंकि इंटरेस्ट नहीं है उसमें उसमें पैदा नहीं किया गया आप बात करें कनेक्शन के टूटने की कनेक्शन टूटने की बात यह है कि अगर आप रियलिटी देखना चाहते हैं तो पाकिस्तान का जो नेशनलिज्म है पाकिस्तान की जो आइडिया है एनफोर्स्ड है लोगों के ऊपर पाकिस्तान डजेंट एग्जिस्ट कोई रियलिटी नहीं है सेवेंटी ईयर ओल्ड नेशन है अभी पाकिस्तान की रियलिटी सिर्फ ये है कि बलोच सिंधी पंजाबी पठान इन सब में एक चीज़ सिर्फ कॉमन है ना इनकी जुबान ना इनकी क्लोदिंग ना इनका खाना ना इनका कल्चर सिर्फ और सिर्फ दीन दीन इस्लाम का अगर आपके बिटवीन जो है बॉन्ड मौजूद है तो है अगर नहीं तो पाकिस्तान को भी तोड़ो फिर जो रियलिटी अगर आपने एथनिसिटी की बेस पे यानी ये जो एक जात पात की जो सोच आपकी पुरानी गंदी एक चली आ रही है उसकी बेस पे अगर लोगों को डिफाइन करना है अगर आपके लिए जो एक बंदा कराची में रहता है और ये ये जो लोग समुंदर के बीच में बैठे हुए हैं डूब रहे हैं उनमें कोई फर्क है 
تو آپ نے اس چیز کو اس کنیکشن کو ہی نہیں سمجھا اس کا مطلب آپ کو یعنی اگر اس کنیکشن کی سمجھ نہیں ہے تو آپ اسی نیشنلزم کا حصہ ہیں جو کہ باقی ساری دنیا پہ ایک بیماری اور ایک ڈیزیز کی طرح پھیل چکا ہے تو پھر آپ کی بھی نیشن ٹوٹنی چاہیے میں یہ نہیں کہہ رہا پاکستان کو ٹوٹنا چاہیے میں صرف یہ کہہ رہا ہوں کہ آپ کی منافقت ہے اگر آپ کی ڈبل اسٹینڈرڈ نہیں دے سکتے تو um uh, standards of living where they actually have i mean their access to everything is kind of limited from permits to getting married to how they can actually do education which is very limited to the normal people uh, and it was quite a, quite an eye opener to see how these people are actually living and are being disregarded by not just the government by the local people local politicians uh, and um, it's just a very uh, severe situation all around I just want to ask you, and I'm sure that the two of my brothers here may have a question for you. As a woman, uh, it must be dire for children and women because they have also been uh, on the boats and so many have died. What is the situation like for women uh, uh, in this area? Sorry, could you repeat that question last part? Yeah, I said that uh, as a woman, I'm asking that the, the situation must be dire for our sisters. Yes. What is the situation like for women who may be pregnant, you know, who have medical needs, you know? Well, I mean, as you obviously know, in a, in a very conservative country like Bangladesh, uh, women's rights are uh, low anyway. Uh, so I think women, uh, Rohingya women especially, suffer from a double disability. I mean, their access to medical care is very, very minimal. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that human aid has provided is uh, pop-up clinics uh, within the unregistered refugee camps across uh, Cox's Bazaar. Uh, and this provides basic medical care, which, I mean, otherwise the, these women uh, just, wouldn't, just wouldn't be able to have. People on the ground still generally do not know about the situation unless, of course, they're following the news because the news has been completely blanked out over the years. <clears throat> What can we do on the ground? Well, I mean... I mean, as you know, the, the Rohingya situation has been in place since the early 90s. Uh, it's not a situation that has gone away. It's, it's, it's always constantly been there. So I think the best thing that we can do is raise awareness, not just at times of uh, international uh, outcry over, um, um, I mean, as we've seen now, the Rohingya boat issue, but consistently keeping that uh, dialogue alive, uh, keep, keeping that awareness uh, at the forefront. and um, doing as many projects as possible through uh, charities as Human Aid and other charities. Uh, I mean, one thing I'd like to say is uh, the charity work out there is very minimal. There's not, I mean, we didn't come across any other charity organization. Uh, I mean, the only UN have two camps there, but that only recognizes, uh, I think, less than a quarter of uh, the total Rohingya population in Cox's Bazaar. So, I mean, as you can imagine, the situation for the vast majority is dire. And of course, if there's anything that you would like to add, Brother Rehman, Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much. Thank you. That was Brother Rehman from uh, my, Human Aid UK. My and comment on it would have been a bit long, but uh, I think you were going to bring Majid in, but do, do, <laughs> do give me a chance. Please. But, um, and of course, if you, you can contact them uh, if you want to talk to him and um, make contribution directly. But Majid, let me come back to you. The fact is that this situation, you're talking about almost 20% of the Burmese population has disappeared and nobody's asking any questions. We don't want to know. Yes, interesting, definitely, yeah. I mean, the, um, Burma has always been a hotspot mm. um, when it has come to uh, the way Muslims have been dealt with. I mean, I've been hear hearing about this since the late 90s, mm. about the persecution which Muslims have faced within that country. Obviously, Adnan's given extensive uh, kind of like a... A discussion on uh, the denial of their rights, the amount of persecution, uh, that the fact that they're stateless, they're not considered as citizens, that they have no rights. 
I mean, what is left of our people then? Well, what about if you're going uh, to be, uh, be treated uh, in that Chui. particular manner? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't quite remember the name. Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung Kyi. She's yeah. won the Nobel Peace Prize. That's right, yeah. And this is the irony of this issue. <laughs> this is the irony. And where is, where is the campaigning for human rights now? Yes. And therefore, it leads to a, an interesting discussion amongst Muslims, amongst the Muslim world, is that human rights seem to be selectively applied. When it comes to the Muslim world and hot spots and where there is trouble and uh, issues that Muslims are facing, Human rights is not really applied there. It well, we're going to, to get kind of rid of the human on. rights bill, aren't we, soon in, in UK? This country? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we, we, we inevitably will. Um, mm -hmm. I, I promise to come back to that, but I, I just want to comment on what the Mr. Rahman. Yeah, Mr. Rahman mm -hmm. from Human Aid UK. Human Aid UK. This is what I meant partially when I was speaking about Muslims having good intentions but not recognizing the root of problems. There, there are and then I'm going to just stop you there, simply because I, want, uh, because I want to hear what you're saying, but I've got a caller. Let me take this kid. Uh, Brother Muhammad Iqbal from London. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome, Salam. Gee, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you very, very clearly. Can oh, you hear us? I can us? hear you very poorly. Nevertheless, um, what I wanted to make the point was this. I think many of these discussions is premised on a false appreciation that somehow countries where there are majority Muslims are going to care about Muslims. These are people nominally speaking in terms of Muslims. So they take Pakistan, a state which primarily was based upon sentiments of Islam rather than actual core Islamic principles. Muhammad Ali Jinnah wants to set up a secular state. So, you know, a lot of these countries that we keep on talking about, Saudi Arabia, this could be America, it could be UK. They're only Muslim majority countries. They're not really Islamic countries. They don't really care about Islamic ethos in terms of their own countries, let alone, in, in, you know, implementing Islamic ethos in other countries like the Rohingya, which even the, Bung the Bengali state, the Bangladeshi state, which has the greatest affinity in terms of ethnicity, have ignored. So I think this is a massive malaise, which people need to uh, appreciate that, you know, Muslims really don't care much about other Muslims. And this is because the fundamentals of our appreciation of our Aqidah, our, you know, fixed loyalties are not there at the end of the day. We are Muslims who pick and choose, and it's easier for us to give a £10 donation to a Muslim charity to feed one Rohingya for a couple of days than to solve this in a social political sense, which is the actual main kind of re resolution to this problem as such. So I think, uh, as the brothers are alluding to uh, in the studio, this is a massive problem that the Muslims need to appreciate. And I think if we just think about it hypothetically, currently in the UK, we as Muslims are gained, uh, you know, blacklisted, are getting prejudiced and discriminated. This could turn around on us very easily in a similar sense. What could we do and what would we do? Would we want handouts from uh, our brothers in Saudi Arabia or would we want some proper resolutions? So I think things come around. As they say, you know, if you don't have help other people properly, no one will come and help you in your time of need either. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. You know, he's raised one important point. He, he timed it so perfectly because I saw He did, but we're going to take a break and I'm going to come back to you. We're going to take a short break. Don't go away. Join the discussion. Jazakallah khair. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. Just before the break, we, are to we were talking about, of course, the subject matter is the Rohingya Muslims who are suffering almost a graveyard in the sea. How is that possible in the 21st century? Who's responsible? Why are they stateless? We heard Mr. Rahman from Human Aid talk about what they've been doing. My two guests, of course, Adnan and Majid, have taken up that it's not a situation that has just risen a few days ago. It's an ongoing. 20% of Burmese population has disappeared. That's 8 million people. Why are we not asking these questions? Where have these 8 million people gone? They disappeared. Commun whole communities have disappeared. And now I want to come back and pick up what you were saying earlier. Um, we were speaking about the, the misdiagnosis of things, or even if you diagnose a problem, then <laughs> applying the wrong treatment. The idea that putting temporary plasters, sorry, let me start off by actually saying that those people, whether as individuals or you know, small groups who go out of their way to do 
this work of charity and try and collect you know aid for people who are struggling and striving and who are going through a, a very difficult time they they do it out of the sincerity of their heart and may Allah SWT reward them for it um, it's a good deed we're not take I'm not saying that you know we take anything away from that but charities both traditionally and even now basically fill in for failings of the state whether that's domestic or international so you know, charities that provide food, for the, food and shelter for the homeless, they do it because, in reality, Cameron's government should be doing it. But because they fail, charities have to step in. It's the exact same. What it does is it puts a temporary bandage uh, and obscures from the view the real problem. The real problem is that these people, as I said already earlier, the Rohingya Muslims, are stateless. Yeah? But they're not the only ones. We're all stateless as Muslims, all across the globe. We, I've, I've already referred to it, and I'll, I'll try and bring the point back up. We've, we've created or we've had imposed upon us these artificial identities that don't sit right with us. They don't belong with us. So it's perplexing for the British media and a lot of the uh, 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 you know, academics and uh, observers, writers, etc., that these, these people of Pakistani origin, these young 20, 21 year olds, born in Britain, so British Pakistanis, what is their big problem with the Muslims being killed in Iraq? It's quite perplexing of you to them because we still have remnants of that, inshallah, it will be revived within the Ummah. Our, our connection to other human beings and the way in which we interact is, or, oh, well, it traditionally was, and inshallah should be again, and that's what we should work towards. As an ummah, it was based upon the bond created by this deen. So everybody you like, everybody you dislike, everybody you're against, everybody you're for, the things you do, the things you, uh, you know, refuse to do, all was regulated by the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the main reason why Rohingya Muslims find themselves in the position that they do. The people committing the acts of barbarity and the atrocities against them, the military junta in Burma, they, they themselves are a mere manifestation of the problem, as the, as the Mongol hordes used to say, we are God's punishment for your crimes. They are a mere manifestation of this problem. The reality is, the Rohingyas are a particularly bleak picture of what's happening to Muslims all across the globe, in Syria, in Palestine, in Chechnya, in places that we've forgotten about because they're not in the news every day, in Kashmir, on a daily basis. This is what happens, to, this is the lot of the Muslims. And all of their problems, you will find, of course they have you know, slight nuances which vary, but all of their problems stem from one chief symptom, which is a lack of uh, uh, unity amongst the Muslims as a political entity. Okay. The Rohingyas would not be stateless, sat in a sea, being kicked around by five nations, refusing to take them. If there was any uh, morality, moral backbone amongst the Muslims, and they were able to establish that which is an obligation of this deen. And I, I know a lot of people will say, and do say, oh, you, but you bring everything back to that subject. But, yeah. The reality is mm -hmm. that if, if I can show you why this is a solution to problems A, B, C, D, and E, then... But, uh, they don't, but, but, but Adnan... We know the solution, and you're absolutely right. The fact is that the world doesn't want to recognize that. The world didn't want to recognize Muhammad Sallallahu when he came. That doesn't make a difference what the world wants. The point is you're responsible for your actions. The world's will, wills and desires are, are a distant secondary tertiary thing if you even consider them at all. What Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, that is what you should be concerned with. If you're going to allow the, the dictates of the, your surroundings and your environment to control the things you do and the, the things you say and the things that you think. If, if, they are me, if you are a mere product of your context, then it doesn't really matter why even pretend that we, we belong to this, this I, I notion or idea of an ummah that stood strong and proud for 1400 years, well into the 20th century. Are we, pay, are we paying lip service to the, what Adnan has just said? Are we paying lip service? to the concept of Ummah, because 
Brother Rahman said, no, the, the, sorry, the caller, um, uh, Muhammad Iqbal from London said, Muslims do not care about Muslims. That's, that, yeah. that, that. We've become a product of the global culture that's around us. A non-reference to a lot of things, I just want to kind of bring a few of those points back, back to home just for you to answer your question. Uh, we live in a, uh, an environment of nation states, fixed borders, uh, that you, you should only be concerned about the affairs internally, that's if they even do, even do that properly, never mind externally, that they should uh, just kind of worry about themselves, your own national anthem, your own flag, your own language, uh, to a certain extent your own ethnicity, okay? Uh, and everything else becomes localized. Now in the last 100 years, 150 years, last 200 years for Defina, there's been a, a, a consist, consistent onslaught of ideas that Muslims should forget their history, Muslims should forget their heritage, what they were, what their legacy is, and how in the past, according to Islamic dictates, the, the <coughs> environment that Muslims lived in internationally was completely different. So in the past, we did have a unifying force, we did have an Islamic state, which did combine many parts of the Muslim world together under a central leadership. It may have been a weak state towards the end, but it was still a state where Islam's policies and ideas were followed both domestically in people's individual lives and collectively as a state apparatus. So the Prophet ﷺ said, a Muslim is the brother of a, of a Muslim. He does not oppress him, nor does he leave him at the mercy of others. Now this, is, this isn't just a, uh, an invite to a charitable act to help your brothers and sisters when they're in need, but the fact is this is state policy. The mm -hmm. fact is that this is the, these, is, these principles are the guide by which then we then uh, go out and about in the world arena and uh, um, help wherever there is a need. So in this case, it straight away applies to the Rohingya Muslims. How can we do this? Let's have a look at some statistics. So if you look at the figures for the naval forces of Egypt, Iran, Turkey and Pakistan, more or less neighboring countries uh, nearby, they've got 57 submarines. This is the naval capability. 57 combined submarines, 46 frigate, frigates, 12 corvettes and 480 coastal defense crafts. I'm going to go back to what uh, Brother Adnan mentioned earlier on. What on earth are they for? In whose interest are they being used? And how does that arsenal, how can it be justified in the courtyard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment? What was the sole purpose for building these technologies if they cannot be served and applied to the use of the Muslim Ummah? So what we need today is a reconnection, as you mentioned before, you and Adhan were talking, there's a connection which has been you know, severed. That reconnection needs to be revived. And that's through building the call for a unifying global Islamic state which breaks down the boundaries amongst Muslims and then brings back that same Islamic culture which unites us, where you know tribal loyalties or national loyalties or culture or clothes or food or customs and traditions are sidelined and the fundamental principle which binds everybody together, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadhi ummatukum ummatan wahida, that indeed you are one nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to, to take. Send, uh, to uh, I'm so sorry, Majid. I'm going to take this call. Uh, Rachel Bentley from an organisation called Children on Edge, who's been doing some work. Uh, good evening, Rachel. Good evening. Are you well? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Rachel, I know that your organisation does some good groundwork. Help us to understand um, the, the kind of help that you've been providing uh, generally to the Rohingyas. Um, I mean, we. We do what we can to access them in, in different places, mainly in internally displaced camps in different camps in different places. But I can't of say course, where of course, of um, course. because it's actually both governments, both the Burmese government inside Myanmar, the authorities there, and also the authorities in Bangladesh, uh, make it very difficult for aid agencies to help the Rohingya people. You, know, you do a good job. And t t tell me, uh, there's a question that I asked. We had somebody from uh, uh, Human Aid UK, and I'm asking that question as a, uh, uh, as a woman. The, are women, how are you helping women who may be in a condition of, you know, who are pregnant, who will require immediate medical help? Yes. I mean, as I say, aid agencies are doing what they can. Our focus as an organization is actually education. So particularly educating girl children, but, but actually it's an issue for the Rohingya um, to have any education at all. They're denied all of their rights pretty much inside Myanmar, subject to forced labor, have no land rights, have many restrictions, even freedom of movement, moving from one village to the next, getting married, all of these are issues. So actually there are some more fundamental issues um, that the Rohingya face. Okay. 
No, that's, that's very kind of you, and I understand that, of course, you can provide certain kind of information to us. What can we on the ground do? Because there's still people who do not, be believe it or not, they don't even know what Rohingya means. What can yeah, we do I mean, on the ground? The situation on the ground, I mean, they are a minor minority group, a uh, Muslim group inside Burma, inside Myanmar, um, but they're denied citizenship there. So because they're denied citizenship, they have very few rights. They're denied access to their rights. And actually, there was communal violence in 2012 um, inside Myanmar. And as a result, as many as 140,000, in fact, that's probably a conservative estimate, are living in squalid camps. And the government try and stop aid groups actually getting aid through to them, almost as though they're trying to deliberately impoverish them. So, I mean, you've seen the, the TV news stories um, of Rohingya escaping in boats. I mean, you've got to be pretty de desperate to get into such boats and to try and escape your land or escape Bangladesh, where they're equally treated pretty, pretty badly. Again, denied help. Um, so, I mean, in, in Bangladesh, for example, there are as many as 200,000 to 500,000 um, Rohingya. Only 30,000 receive official aid through the United Nations in two camps. So it's a desperate, desperate situation. Aid agencies like ourselves do what they can to access these people, both within Myanmar, inside Myanmar, and also inside Bangladesh. But it's very, very difficult because simply those governments do not want aid groups to help them. Um, so they're as I say, they're stateless people. They're not wanted in Myanmar. They're not wanted in Bangladesh. So in absolute desperation, they get in boats to try and get to other lands, often um, at extortionate rates. And traffickers um, charge them huge amounts of money. Um, and as, as we've seen in the news in the last few weeks, many of them are stuck in boats because of the situation in Thailand where the government found um, camps where the traffickers were holding the people, asking for more money to, before they could get them through to Malaysia or other countries. So desperate, desperate, desperate situation. But what needs to happen is that, you know, Burma needs to actually allow these people their rights and give them citizenship. Um, if they had access, like every other citizen in Burma, to just basic services, basic education, health care, um, a basic standard of living, I mean, life's tough for most citizens in Burma, but for the Rohingya, you know, they're, they're denied very few of their rights. So that's where the situation needs to be resolved. And the countries in Southeast Asia are a bit complicit and not saying much about this. They need to speak up and put pressure on the Burmese government to actually do something um, about these people. But in particular, they need to be given citizenship. Rachel, we are eternally grateful to you for giving us your time and we are also absolutely honored to have you um, and doing the work that your organization Children on Edge does. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving your time up for us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. That was uh, Rachel Bentley from Children on Edge and I think she did um, say that pressure must be placed on the Burmese government. And I think if we can't do anything, at least we can write to the embassy. We can go and visit our MP. We can write in the media. We can educate ourselves. I'm sorry, Majid, I did cut you off at the time. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, I was going to give you a quote here, which I think really kind of um, establishes my point about what the mindset and the environment that Muslims have lived in in the past, <clears throat> whether they lived under a globalized Islamic state which didn't have any boundaries or any territories and considered everybody as equal citizens, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. Omar Ibn Abdul Aziz, who is also known very, very famously as being part of the Khulafa uh, Rashidin, the rightly guided Khalifs of Islam, he said in a statement, he said, place wheat on the top of, tops of mountains. So it cannot be said that a bird went hungry in the land of the Muslims. So never mind, any, uh, never mind human beings, but even animals in the lands of Islam, in the lands of Muslims, were treated equitably, okay, and with respect. And the fact that you know there should be abundance of resources for everybody to share and live collectively in the state, and their rights to be looked after. This was that mindset there. It wasn't like a random, you know, some random words of charity because he's rich. It's because this was a central responsibility which Islam places upon the rulers. Um, and therefore, the ruling elite that we see in the Muslim world today, are number one, do not represent Islam. Their, their political systems don't re resemble Islam. And their vision for, for what, where they want to take their people forward don't resemble the, the project which Islam wants them to embark on. And that's why it's high time now that 
we continually call upon the Muslim world to you know, move away from these artificial boundaries and establish a state based upon Islam that calls people collectively to um, um, you know, establish the rules of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also when issues like this happen, they're able to respond according to the, accordingly to the Islamic principles. You know, what I'm hearing is that this is not a pipe dream. It's a reality that can actually happen. A reality that was established for well over 13 centuries far bigger pipe dream to actually hope that democracy is going to give you something when it hasn't given anything to the world repeatedly. If you want to speak about pipe dreams, everything, all, all discussions are very carefully manicured and uh, managed. You have heard of the, uh, the cafe that was uh, held up by a lone gunman in Australia. You have heard of the the uh, attempted attack on uh, Geller's uh, uh, you know, event in Texas a few days ago. You have heard of uh, the handful of people. One person's uh, life being lost is too many, but a handful of people who were killed um, in France over mm -hmm. the Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks. And everybody else who's deemed important, you know, any danger to them is, is publicized and the media rightly you know, discusses some of those stories. But it would be rightly if it did so equitably, justly, and uh, consistently. How many Muslims have been killed in the Central African Republic? How many Rohin uh, Rohingya Muslims have been put through this absolute uh, abyss of human behavior for the past three or four years? Why is it that people don't know about it? It's not a coincidence or an accident. You know, let's, let's ignore there are other examples, but the reason why I omitted them is, for example, you know, the, the uproar of all oh, this rising anti-Semitism in Britain because there were, I think, 30-odd more attacks reported last year than the year before um, in, within Britain. Because those are domestic news, so you can try and say, okay, the media takes interest in them because they are, you know, within Britain. I'm talking global stuff here, Texas, Australia, other side of the world. Why is it that these specific conflicts where Muslims are being butchered are ignored, but ISIS... ISIS gets more column inches than any celebrity in the West. Well, everybody knows why, about that. Why, why, why that disparity? And it's not a, 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 an accidental thing. There's a, there's a deliberate, a deliberate uh, you know, uh, idea, ide ideological warfare at play. Muslims need to wake up to that reality. As you said, you know, try and raise awareness, um, speak about it, write about it, etc. But ultimately do so with a clear-cut mindset to be able to not just say this is what's happening, but also be able to give a treatment and a prognosis of this is what you need to be doing to resolve this. This is what we as an ummah need to do short term, medium term, long term. This is what we need to do to resolve this. This is where the solution lies. Stop thinking that human beings are born as charity cases and that because we as human beings are given the duty to be charitable, Therefore, that in itself is somehow a problem solver. It isn't. It's merely a humanitarian thing that human beings are duty bound to do for those less fortunate than, them, than themselves. Charities are not supposed to provide solutions for state problems. State problems are solved by the existence of states, whether they be diplomatic or they be other means. But when you don't have you don't have that strength and that power and that unity and you can't even realize it. You can't step into a boxing ring without having any arms. It just makes no sense. Good point and I'm going to stop you there. Because, and the reason I'm going to stop my, um, uh, Adnan there is because he's actually concluded. And I, 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 it was great. You, you said exactly what should have been said. We've come to that point where we say to uh, our audience, thank you for watching, but it's extremely important that you do something. We have to 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 do something. We Help is needed. Dua will help. There's no doubt about it. It breaks down walls. But it needs a collective response. Get Writing, write to your MP, write in the media, 
speak about it. Why is our government not addressing the issue? Why are we not pressurizing the Burmese government? It's extremely important that that is done. Adnan, thank you so much. Majid, Jazakallah khair. Pleasure. And of course, thank you for allowing us into your homes. Join me again next week. Until then, look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. Assalamu alaikum.